Hello, and welcome to AG Bell's 2022 Global Listening and Spoken Language Symposium. I am Emilio Alonso Mendoza, the CEO of the Alexander Graham Bell Association for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. I am very, very happy to welcome over 700 and growing professionals in listening and spoken language from more than 50 countries. Our focus is to ensure that every child who can benefit from listening and spoken language has a qualified and caring professional to support their advancement. That's why I am pleased that among our fellow attendees, there are 100 students who are here to learn from the outstanding professionals in our field. You all are joining us for two full days of learning, connecting, and growing, and we're very, very happy to see and hear you. This is a very, very special symposium because this year we're celebrating a key milestone in the history of AG Bell and the AG Bell Academy. We launched our first non-English certification exam, I should say Spanish, and among our, our attendees are many of the newly certified Spanish-speaking listening and spoken language specialists who just got the news that uh, they uh, had passed the exam last week and, uh, and are extremely thrilled and so are we. I want to thank the 50 professionals who applied to take the Spanish VEDA certification exam. And I especially want to thank the 15 uh, listening and spoken language Spanish speaking professionals who participated in the adaptation of the exam. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of negotiating, but, we, but at the end, we had a, a great time and we had a wonderful product and the results are in now. And uh, I, I know you're all pleased as, as to where we are. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Dr. Carol Flexer and Donald Goldberg, and of course, our dear Gayla Guinard for their oversight, guidance, and leadership throughout the process. We are now uh, pleased to have over 1,070 professionals around the world, but we need so many, many more. That makes continuing education vital to our field. We're committed to honoring this annual symposium to provide you with ways to earn many continuing education credits with the most up-to-date information in our field. Another step forward in our certification program is this new LSL registry. The AG Bell Academy has now made it much simpler and more affordable for you to work towards your certification. We thank the Academy Board for their guidance throughout this process. And if you need to know more about the registry, you'll see a slide during the break with a, a QR code that will take you directly there. I encourage you to sign up as soon as you can so you can easily save your CEU credits and get direct support from the Academy as you work towards certification. Throughout the symposium, you'll hear from an array of wonderful and talented listening and spoken language professionals from across the globe. Our keynote speakers will deliver the latest information on research in our field. And I'm really looking forward to the forums on innovations in technology from our key sponsors, Cold Care Americas, Advanced Bionics, and Medell. Uh, before we start, and we're gonna get started very soon, I would like to thank the many people who made this symposium possible. AG Bell is grateful for the guidance and support of the members of our three boards of directors throughout the year. We thank the 2022 Symposium core committee members from six countries for their commitment to bring high quality education to you. They attended many meetings and encouraged many of you to participate in the symposium. We're also thankful for the volunteer symposium 40 ambassadors who reached out to encourage professionals in their countries, cities, and towns to benefit from this learning opportunity. I remember when we first had nine. Now we're up to 40 and growing, so thank you all for all the work you do in, in your countries. I also want to uh, uh, recognize the, commi the commitment of key sponsors of the Global Symposium who help to ensure that this event takes place, but also contribute their knowledge to the program. 
Our Cradle to Career partners are year-long sponsors who help us uh, bring to life new ideas and new ways to connect with and support families. We thank Akuz for their support of AG Bell, as well as Cochlear Americas, who bring the patient su uh, parent support line and parent chats to you, which I hope that all of you uh, share those resources with the families you serve. I want to thank CapTel, our, our RIT National Technical Institute for the Deaf, Decibel Therapeutics, Hamilton CapTel, the Paul School, St. Joseph Institute for the Deaf, Central Institute for the Deaf, ASHA, Sunshine Cottage, and Auditory Burial Center for their support of the symposium. There's a special thanks, of course, to the National Institute on, on Deafness and Communications Disorder for their conference grant. This grant not only supports our keynote speakers, but also supports the symposium proceedings after the event. Additionally, NIDCD has funded scholarships to enable 40 students to benefit from the symposium education. Professional scholarships have also been provided throughout a special fund drive uh, led by board members Jane Madell and Fernanda Hinojosa. We thank supporters, which include Lillian Flores Beltran, Carlos Aguirre, Charles and Johnny Alberg, Aliette Alfano, Nan Ellen East, Sherry Fekinscher, Carol Flexer, Gayla Guinard, Marcia Haynes, Maria Melo, Mila, Laura Peterson, Lynn Robertson, Emma Rushbrook, Rebecca Schmidt, Jenna Boss, the Children's Hearing Institute, and I guess myself, yours truly. <laughs> We're grateful for your commitment to supporting high quality education for our professionals all over the world. Thank you to all our volunteers, speakers, and supporters. I also want to thank our staff members in Spain and the US who have worked tirelessly to bring this symposium to you. But I would be remiss if I didn't send a special thank you to Gayla Guinard, our Chief Strategy and Programs Officer, who has been inspirational to us all and who's going to have a much needed rest beginning on Friday. Finally, along with Gayla, I would like to thank our 120 symposium presenters. You are what makes this 2022 symposium fresh, unique, informative, and inspiring. Please join me in a virtual round of applause for all of those who have been involved in making the next two days valuable and memorable. And now I'll introduce you to the real star of the show, Kayla Guinard. Kayla. Thank you, Emilio. And hello to everyone from AG Bell. For me, these are definitely the two most exciting days of 2022. We've been working for these days and I love them in particular because while we cannot yet be together, or we are not yet together face to face, we are together virtually. Next year, we will plan to be together in Washington, DC, and we'll be providing a hybrid conference. So hopefully you can attend in Washington, but if you need to come online, that works as well. So our main goal of the symposium is to learn. And even better, to take something we've learned and make our individual parts of the world better places. Whether you are from Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, India, Japan, Australia, Denmark, Canada, Nicaragua, Spain, Kenya, or the United States, and we have several other countries that are here, we are thrilled to have you here. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 2022 AGVL Symposium. Today and tomorrow would not be possible without the foundational support provided to us again this year by Blue Sky eLearning and their PATH Learning Management System and their tech experts. As well, AI Media and Abilingua are with us again to provide captioning and oral translation. Casey Judd of Conference Direct is behind the scenes with the whole team, along with Joni Alberg, who is working with our moderators and our presenter room translators. 
We again thank our staff from AG Bell International for the um, some of the translation that they'll be doing related to the Q&A pod this year. Most important of all are the presenters of this, of this symposium. They've done much work and careful preparation in anticipation of sharing their knowledge, skills, and expertise with you. And on behalf of our symposium advisory committee, in particular the co-chairs, Elizabeth Tishkowitz, Hilda Fermansky, and Terry Ouellette, who have spent countless hours thoughtfully planning the symposium, may you enjoy it as much as we have hoped. There are a few things to share with you that will help you navigate the symposium. First, your ability to stay online with us is very much related to your internet connection and bandwidth. The first way to try to improve your connection is to select your refresh button. Second, use the control panel that you see. Most of you will see it on your right and navigate through the sessions that way. We do have closed caption, or sorry, we have captioning. Um, you can go to EN for English or ES for Spanish. As well, under EN, you may also select four additional languages for which we are providing automated captioning. Those would be Portuguese, Indonesian, Japanese, or Arabic. And then under the translation button, you will see either English or Spanish, and you will um, touch that button when you need to hear the other language. Most of our sessions are in English, some are in Spanish, but they, they will be translated. The quality of captioning and translation is very much related, again, to the quality of the speech signal heard. Captioners and translators have prepared for the symposium and will give their best efforts to provide accurate captioning and translation. Automated captions will be slightly delayed as those use the English captions to first translate into the additional languages that are then captioned during the symposium. If there are any technical difficulties, no worries, those will be fixed prior to the online symposium, which will run from July 20th to July 31st. As attendees, you will not be able to use your microphone to communicate with the presenter or other attendees. I can already see that the audience members have probably found the chat, open chat, and we encourage you to greet and meet others in the chat throughout the symposium. Your, your questions of presenters should go through the Q&A. It's called the Slido Q&A feature. And those questions, again, will be translated um, either into English or Spanish. There will be 15 minute breaks in between nearly every session and there will be video content with announcements during those breaks as you enter the next session. Please keep an eye out for those QR codes that will help you find all the information you need to know about certification and, and services through AG Bell, the Academy and AG Bell International. Last, as we close in on the hour, I must say a few words about CEUs, which are available to those who've registered as professionals for the symposium. Open up a CEU form to get started, and you'll see that at the top of each day's schedule. Use this same form throughout the live symposium. Click each session you attended. Be sure to write two statements of new information learned. Be sure to stay in the whole session because your attendance is recorded. Um, during the symposium, pardon me, the symposium. You can edit that form by clicking save and continue later. Jot form will prompt you to create an account, but just simply choose to skip create an account and you can have that form emailed to you or ask for a link um, as you go to edit the form. Submit your CEU form no later than July 5th. And with that, momentarily, we will have an introduction of our uh, first presenter of the day, keynote speaker, Dr. Dathan Rush. Welcome, everybody, to the first keynote presentation for the AG Bell Global Listening and Spoken Language Symposium. Before we get started, I have a few brief announcements to get us going and kick us off. The first one is CEU related. Um, as a reminder, if you wish to earn CEUs for this session, you need to stay for the entire session. 
on your electronic CEU grid indicate you attended the session and write two statements about new information or knowledge you acquired. Be sure you use just one CEU grid for the entire symposium. After you enter your information for the session, choose Save and Continue at the bottom of the form. You must select Save and Continue every time you enter something on the form throughout the symposium. At the end of the symposium, you click on Submit, and then your CEU grid must be completed and submitted no later than July 5th. You'll also see that you can chat and interact with the different um, symposium attendees using the chat function. But remember to please use the Q&A tab if you have any questions and our keynote speaker will either um, address during the symposium presentation or at the end if we have time. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dathan Rush, who is the director of the Family, Infant and Preschool Program in Morganton, North Carolina. He has a master's degree in speech and language pathology and doctoral degree in child and family studies. He is the co-author of the Early Childhood Coaching Handbook and the Early Intervention Teaming Handbook, the Primary Service Provider Approach. And without further ado, I, I welcome Dr. Rush. Well, thank you very much. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to be here I'm with you all for your symposium and to help you all kick it off. So thanks for um, the invitation. I, I'm pl pleased to be able to talk to you about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is caregiver coaching. And although the focus uh, says uh, caregiver coaching and early childhood intervention, rest assured that the coaching characteristics that I'm going to be sharing with you this, this day um, can be used across caregivers. It doesn't have to be uh, limited, certainly, to early intervention. Um, it can be used with um, other caregivers. Too. And when I say caregivers, I mean parents, family members, um, grandparents who may be uh, raising or taking care of the child, child care providers, teachers, all the important people in the life of the child we would include as a caregiver. Just over 30 years ago, I began my career as a speech language pathologist. I was working in a clinic um, providing services. I had a very nice waiting room where the families would wait as I um, supported the child's communication development and learning in my office. I was so pleased to have my child size table and chairs and I had my materials, you know, all around me and I loved my materials. I, mean, I can't tell you enough how much I loved my materials. And then one day, the early intervention program came into the picture in uh, Oklahoma, the state in the U.S. where I was working at the time. And I was invited to be one of the first speech language pathologists working in that program. Now, since it was a first and I could be one of the first, I thought, what a great opportunity this is. I think I might be interested in doing this. So I agreed. It wasn't later until I learned that the early intervention program used this thing called natural environments, which meant that I wouldn't be providing the services in my, my office anymore. I would be going into families' homes, out into the community, where children would be if they didn't have a disability. And so, uh, you know, this is quite a, a, a conundrum to me, but I thought, okay, I, you know, I can, I, can, I can do this. So I, I got the manliest la bag that I could find, and I put my, some of my favorite things in my bag. This was going to be my therapy bag. And so I put my, 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 my Peabody articulation cards in there. And I put my, my language cards that I, that I made myself from uh, pictures that I cut out of National Geographic's magazine. And I'd laminated them with clear contact paper. Now, this was 30 years ago. And I put those in there. And um, I put my, um, my Candyland bingo in there because um, I needed, you know, some games and activities. I threw in some of my favorite toys, including my Fisher Price farm. I would never leave my office without my Fisher Price farm because what child doesn't need to learn? Animal sounds, functional skill, right? So I tossed all those in there and I was ready to go on my first home visit. And so I got to my visit and I realized that there was a lot of things happening. I mean, it wasn't my quiet office that I had set up, and, and there was no waiting room for the parents. And there were these, these siblings that were there. And some of the families that I visited, they had 
animals, pets. And so there I was, sitting in the living room floor with my bag, the child, and all these things, which is called real life, happening around me. And so it didn't take me long to figure out that what I'd done in my office wasn't really going to work that I really needed to figure out a different way, a new way. And, and I had to engage those other people um, because I couldn't just be the show. And so my colleague, um, Dr. Melissa Sheldon and I, she's a physical therapist. I'm a speech language pathologist. We were working on the same intervention team. We had to figure out just for ourselves, how are we gonna do this? How, how can we engage these important adults? Because when real life, became evident to me in those homes and in the community and those childcare and preschool classrooms, I began to realize that animal sounds really are irrelevant at this point because families needed to know how to help their children, let them know what it was they wanted to eat at mealtime or what piece of clothing they wanted to wear when it was time to get dressed to avoid a meltdown or a temper tantrum. And when the child was running out in the yard and headed towards the street, they needed to know how to follow instructions. And parents needed to be able to, to, to yell out an instruction and get them to be able to hear it and recognize it and stop. Those were the functional skills, communication skills that the young children and the families needed. So how was I going to help these important adults? Because I, uh, I wasn't enough. Uh, me being there one time a week, two times a week, even every day for a short period of time wasn't going to be enough. So I had to figure out a way that was going to be more sustainable, more practical, and more effective. And so we, we dug to the research. We dug into the research. We'd, we'd started seeing the term coaching being used in the early 1990s in some of the therapy literatures. And so we're, we were trying to figure out, well, how do you do that? What do you do? It sounds like a good idea. It sounds like something we could do. What's the research behind it? How do you do it? And so we started digging in. Now, I knew at that time I wasn't coaching. I was the event. It was all about me getting the child to produce communication. And, and um, sometimes I reverted to telling the caregivers what to do. And, and that worked in some instances, but in many instances it didn't. Um, and why didn't it work? Well. When I go to the doctor and the doctor tells me I need to be exercising, why don't I exercise? You know, I, just, I just don't find time, seem to find time to do it. And so families are busy. They didn't have time to do my word lists and to work on the homework and the handouts that I would get, give them. So it had to be more than homework and handouts. I had to have this way of engaging them. And I had to be sure that what I was doing was research-based and that it was going to be effective. Now, you know, fast forward 30 years and coaching has become more mainstream. This way of interacting with the importance of adults is more mainstream. And when I talk to providers all across the world, um, I hear people say, yeah, I coach, I use coaching. But we need to make sure that we're all using it in accordance with the research that is going to lead us to the effective outcomes that we want and need with the children and families that we're working with. And so what I want to share with you in these few minutes is an approach for using coaching and operationalizing the research-based definition and the characteristics. So let's just start right off with that research-based definition. What is it that I mean when I say coaching? Well, it's an adult learning strategy. And it's an adult learning strategy in which the coach would help the learners think about and reflect on what it is that they're doing what it is that they're doing that's working, and perhaps things that they're doing that may not be working so well to determine what do I need to do? How well is this, this working? What do I need to do differently to support the child in this context, but in other contexts as well? The coaching approach that we use is grounded in a number of theoretical frameworks that are used and were, were and have been used related to coaching, um, and, and they're expert-based goal-oriented, a contextual approach that's focused on adult learning. And so I'm going to take a few minutes and, and talk to you about how does coaching apply to these key tenets or these um, approaches? And, and why even should we, why should we be using coaching? 
you know, children don't just learn when we're present. We as the therapists, as the educators, children are learning all the time. How do we capitalize on those natural learning opportunities and not limit our outcomes just to the time when we're there? So let me give you a little bit of background and rationale about this coaching approach. So expert-based, what do we mean by that? Well, you all are experts in your field. You have certifications, you have degrees, you've spent a lot of time earning those degrees, get it, getting your experience, getting your certifications, and, and the families are accessing you because you have this knowledge, this certification, these degrees. So you're an expert in your field, you have expertise to share versus What's also talked about in the coaching literature, a peer-to-peer -peer approach, where both parties in the coaching relationship are learning the same thing at the same time. That's not really the type of coaching we're talking about. We're talking about expert-based, but it's not a power over relationship. It's a, a shared relationship in which the other party, the caregiver, is coming to the relationship with lots of knowledge, too. They know the child better than we possibly could. So we're gonna to partner together in this approach on behalf of the child to get to the outcomes that we're wanting. So what we know about what we call effective help giving, what the literature refers to as effective help giving, is that how we as practitioners provide our interventions and the experiences and opportunities for parents is critical. And, and how we provide our supports is gonna determine the success of the, the services and the interventions that we use. So there are three components to this effective help giving and capacity building process that ties with coaching. First, we support the caregiver's strengths and abilities. They're already doing something. They're already wanting their child to communicate and they're doing everything they know how to support that communication. So we wanna build on that. We wanna use and recognize their current skills and abilities to get to their desired outcomes. And we want to help them recognize the opportunities that they have, not just when we're there, not just totally reliant on us, and that they embrace their responsibility for parenting, for teaching, if they're a, care, if they're a preschool teacher or a child care provider, and supporting the child's what we call participation in their everyday activities. There are two types of effective help giving. One is participatory. We know that in order for a person that we're coaching capacity to be built, they have to be engaged, they have to participate, they have to join with us. We can't do it all. We can't, um, we can't let them just rely on us as knowing all and being able to do all and accomplish all the outcomes that we all want. They have to participate during our visits and between our visits. And our help giving has to be relational. And this is what we're all really good at. We wouldn't be doing what we do if we weren't good at building trust with the person that we're working with, showing respect for them and for what they know, being empathetic and, and letting them know that we truly care about them. We care about the family and we care about the outcomes that they want. We're good at this, but we have to bring that relational piece into with participation in order for our help giving and our capacity building to be effective. So coaching is a specific help giving strategy that we're gonna use whenever we use this capacity building approach. Now, when we talk capacity building, what I mean by that is increasing the caregiver's competence, their knowledge, their skills, knowing what to do, and their confidence. I want them to know that they know and recognize that what they're doing is working. And if it's not, pausing and thinking about what they need, need to do to improve it or to change it, because I'm not always going to be there. And so in those times when I'm not present, I, I need their competence and their confidence to be high so that the child's continue, continued learning um, within their everyday activities. Our approach to coaching is goal oriented. Now, here in the US, we have a federal law related to how we provide early intervention and educational services. And, and that federal law in early intervention requires that we have an individualized family service plan, an IFSP. For children three to 21 in our educational services, they have an individual, they have an individual education program. Some of you may have 
um, individual habilitation plans or treatment plans or um, plans of care that you use. But regardless of what the planning document or tool is, you, you have goals. You have goals for children and families. And I, I encourage you to think about those goals in terms of how functional, meaningful, and participation-based are they. In early intervention in the U.S., the person or persons who evaluate the effectiveness of the goals, the progress, is the caregiver, the parent. So we want to make sure that they're relevant to parents. I could write beautiful goals, but if they're not relevant to the parent, if the parent doesn't understand them and it's not their outcomes for their child, then they're less likely to be invested and they're less likely to participate. I often say a goal is only as good as the caregiver's ability to remember it. A goal is only as good as the caregiver's ability to remember it. And so lots and lots of goals it can be too much and too overwhelming. So what is it that the caregiver wants to have happen? What's their priority for the child? Our approach to coaching is contextual. We, we coach in context. We don't coach just about kind of esoteric things or topics. We coach in a very practical, contextual way. And our context is the family's routines or the classroom routines, the childcare routines, and the activities in which they participate. And we call this natural learning environment practices. And, and when we look at the research that that developed natural learning environment practices, there are three research-based characteristics that we would use. First, we use everyday activities, meal time, bath time, toothbrushing time, getting dressed time, feeding the, the dog time, um, riding in the car time, um, walking to the bus stop time. As Those are opportunities for children to learn. Children learn by participation. When you your child learned to walk, you you gave them the opportunity to. When your child learned to crawl, you looked at what, what was motivating. And sometimes your, your child just took off because they wanted to get to the, get to the family um, dog or they wanted to get to sister's toy that they, they had been told you know, not to mess with. So they're motivated to get to it. We use child interests because that's motivating because it brings them into the activity and it keeps them engaged. If a young child likes cars and trucks or likes dinosaurs or likes anything, um, you know, princess related, then that's going to, that's going to keep them engaged. That's going to get them and keep them engaged in activities that they want to participate in. And sometimes we can use those interests to get them involved in activities like toothbrushing or bath time, or sometimes even eating when they may not want to initially do it. So should we use child interests? And we teach caregivers how to be responsive to the children's interests and to the children's learning. And that's what we're all good at. We have lots and lots of strategies, don't we, for supporting children's communication. And so we want to make sure that we give some of that away, that we help the caregivers know what to do in those real life activities to support the child's learning and development. I've given you a handout called an at a glance for natural learning environment practices. And on this at a glance, it gives you the three characteristics as well as the indicators for what you would do to operationalize those characteristics. So there's more information on that handout for you. So here's the strategy. Um, and and uh, Dr. Mary Beth Bruder at the University of Connecticut, she uh, kind of coined some of this in, when she was the co-director of the um, Research and Training Center on Natural Learning Opportunities many, many years ago. She said we need to use an upside down and backwards way of thinking about it. We need to start with the activities rather than the skills. So our testing yields skills that we need to work on with the child. But real life starts with the activities. So what are the activities in which the young child needs to participate with the child and family? What are the learning opportunities? So if the child's participating in mealtime, what are the learning opportunities? Being in your high chair, um, uh, getting your food, eating your food. What are the desired skills? Being able to sit up in the high chair, being able to make a request for the food or pick between a couple of choices to get your food or your drink. So start with the activity because it provides the context and the caregivers are much more familiar with that. So what we know is that learning a new skill requires practice. Our visits typically don't occur frequently enough for the child to get enough practice. 
So we have to rely on those important caregivers in the child's life to support the child's learning along with us. So since children learn best from those important people in their daily routines, we know that caregiver implemented intervention works. We have a mountain of research evidence on caregiver implemented interventions. And some are very technical and very specific, but research tells us parents can do this. If we make it a part of their parenting and caregiving routines, they will do this because they have to do those, they have to feed their child, they have to change their child's diaper. So we can support the caregivers in making a difference. And coaching is the strategy that we use to support them. So what about adult learning? Well, it's, I said it's an adult learning practice. So what we know, and there was a, a research synthesis that was done in the US by the National Science Foundation over 20 years ago now that said learners have preconceptions. They have preconceptions about how the world works. So we have to build on what they already know. And like I said earlier, they've been doing things to support their child's learning and development. So we wanna build on what they know. They need, a, they need a strong foundation and a conceptual framework. So we provide multiple in-depth opportunities for learning. And so they practice when we're there, they practice when we're not there. And this, this synthesis said, everyone can be taught to reflect. And reflection is a key characteristic of coaching. So we want to ask the caregivers their ideas. We want to join with them in what they know. And because what we, what we know is it can further support the child's learning when we're there and when we're not there. And that brings us right back to the definition as we get ready to dig in and talk about this adult learning strategy that we call coaching. Now, I would like to say that um, my colleague, Dr. Melissa Sheldon and I were so smart that we were able just to create this on our own, that we came up with this on our own, but we didn't. We dug into the research because we wanted to, to use an approach for coaching that had research behind it that said, if you use these practices, you get these positive outcomes. And so what we found when we looked at the research literature across fields related to coaching was that these five characteristics were always present. So now in our visits, we're always using these five characteristics of coaching. How do we know for coaching? We do these five things. Now I was hopeful because I like things that are you know, steps. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you get this outcome. Coaching didn't work that way. These characteristics didn't come together that way. So you'll see that they're not numbers besides these characteristics, they're bullets because these are used within the course of your visit, within the course of your conversation. And so some of them occur at certain times, but we want this to flow naturally. So let's, let's um, kind of dissect this and talk about these characteristics. You have another handout in your packet called the At a Glance for Coaching. That is um, a blue At a Glance, if you have it uh, printed in color, that will give you the characteristics of coaching and the indicators of the practice that I'm gonna be talking about. So let's, let's start by talking about planning. I'm gonna start and finish the characteristics by talking about planning. So we make sure that we have a plan for every visit. We have a planned activity setting. That's gonna be our context. So we're going at meal time, or we're gonna be at the childcare program during circle time, or during tra their transition time, or um, book reading time, or we're gonna be at the family's home when the child is getting dressed because that provides opportunities for communication. And then we have a plan for in between the visits because this learning has to occur not just when we're there. And so we call it the between visit plan. And so they have this previous joint plan that we developed. So for example, and I start every visit this way, I'm gonna um, ask them, I'm gonna say something like, last time when I was here, you were gonna have um, Jacob up in the high chair and, and he was gonna tell you, using his words, what it is that he wanted to drink at mealtime. Tell me how well that's been working since I was here last. So we're gonna review that plan. I'm gonna ask them to reflect on it. And then I'm open to it worked, it didn't work, they didn't try it. And then we'll, we'll dig into that. If 
they didn't understand the strategies or the strategies that we talked about using in that moment in that activity weren't working then if i'm there during a meal time or snack time and we plan for that for today then we're going to flow right into that real life activity and we're going to use that as context for continued learning so we always start by revisiting the previous joint plan another characteristic of coaching is observation observation watch wait listen see what they're doing observation makes you look really smart because you are seeing in the real life moment how this is working how is the child verbalizing how is the child using their listening skills in this moment in this activity what's the caregiver doing that's promoting that or inhibiting that now our tendency is to jump right in there we observe long enough to develop our ideas for what's going on and then we jump in with advice or suggestions we want to step back hold back a bit observe for the purpose of understanding what's taking place so that we can support the caregiver in thinking and analyzing in the way that we're thinking and analyzing so when i'm not there to jump in with instruction guidance or ideas they can process and think about how's this working what could i do differently so i'm observing in order to further support and help them analyze and use reflection when I'm, which i'm going to talk about here in a minute if the caregiver needs me to be the if they need to observe and they need me to show or model i can do that i can show them what to do as a part of coaching we call it but we call it intentional modeling intentional so if the person i'm coaching is more of a a visual learner and it helps them to see what it is that i'm doing and to see how it's working then i can i can use modeling i can show i'm not going to jump to showing i'm going to find out if they need me to show them i'm going to ask a question like um would it be helpful if if i tried something here or could i show you what this might look like and i asked them that question because i want to mark it i want to mark this as here's an opportunity for you to observe me demonstrating with the child but i'm keeping it in context i'm not pulling the child to the side out of the snack time or out of the center time i'm keeping it in context so the learning for the child and the caregiver stays in context and i'm going to follow a seven step process for intentional modeling and this seven step process is written down on that blue at a glance for coaching it's in the observation column so i'm going to explain what i'm going to do i'm going to get down on his level i'm going to explain why i'm going to make sure he can see me eyeball to eyeball and i'm going to break a piece of the banana that he's having for snack time i'm going to break it into several pieces and i'm going to offer it up to him and i'm going to ask him what he wants and then i'm going to wait for him to try to say the word and if he doesn't say it i'm going to say it for him and make sure that he's able to see my mouth and so then i do the model i demonstrate with the child there in snack time for the teacher the child care provider the parent and then i'm going to ask them to reflect how well do you think that worked how did that work for him how did that work for me how will that work for you and so then i'm going to invite them to try it i'm going to get the child back into their hands as quickly as possible because they're the one that needs to learn how to do it and be able to do it with the child and then they're going to try it and then we're going to reflect on how that worked and we'll we'll adjust it if we need to and then we're going to figure out how do we take what we just did and how's that going to look not at snack time but how's that going to look at breakfast tomorrow morning so i want to get it into their plan and that's likely going to be a part of our between visit plan so observation we want to use observation we want to make sure that we can see what it looks like in the real life activity and then if they need to see me try a strategy i'm there to teach them side by side shoulder to shoulder action practice is another characteristic of coaching Char coaching is not a passive process a lot of people think coaching is um just sitting on the couch and asking the caregiver questions and i say i say no that's couching that's not coaching coaching is interactive 
Coaching is dynamic. Coaching requires participation. And so I'm going to ask the caregiver to show me, and, and that gives me the opportunity to observe, and they get to demonstrate. I'm going to give the, the caregiver the opportunity to practice what it is that we're talking about and what it is that we're doing. So I want them to be able to practice some of those strategies that I'm teaching them to use. I want them to see how it works in real time, in real life, with me there. And so um, when, when I give them the opportunity to practice, then I can, I can see it, they can experience it, and then again, we can figure out what we need to do differently. If I need to, I can use verbal prompting. So a caregiver who's more of an auditory listener, I'm sorry, more of an auditory learner, then I can use verbal prompting. Me showing may not be as effective in helping them. So I'm going to prompt them. I can talk them through the strategy step by step as they try it. If I need to use direct teaching for the caregiver or for in a moment, for the, if I need to use direct teaching with the child, I can do that in that moment. But then I want to step back and have the caregiver analyze and think about what I did and then have them try it, action practice. And then we're going to think about and identify ways that the caregiver can continue and keep doing this when I'm not there because this has got to be sustainable. It can't last just the length of the session, just the amount of time that I'm there. We've got to keep it rolling forward. Another characteristic of coaching is reflection. Now, reflection is what a lot of people think of when they think of coaching because they think about the questions that we ask because we want to prompt, prompt thinking on the part of the caregiver. I say the R in reflection also stands for respect. We respect what they know. That's why we ask questions. Caregivers have ideas. They've tried things. If I just come into a, a situation and I observe long enough to start giving suggestions and ideas, I could be disrespecting them because they may have already tried those things and found out that they didn't work. If I give them or, or talk about a list of recommendations that I have and they've tried some of those and they know it didn't work, that diminishes my credibility. So I'm going to ask. I want to find out what they know. I want to find out what it is that they're doing. Reflection is what sets coaching apart from other types of adult learning strategies because we want to pause. We want that opportunity for them to think through, think about what they're doing, analyze it, come up with other ideas. You know, when we ask people their ideas, I'm not asking them to try to get them, coax them into answering in the way that I want. I'm open to the possibilities. I'm open to their ideas. And I have two criteria that I use that I measure a caregiver ideas by. Is it safe and is it legal? And if it, if it meets those two criteria, we could talk about it. Now, I didn't say we could jump to trying it because some things may be contraindicated. It may not be helpful. It may um, not be the way that would be most helpful for this child to learn and participate. But if we haven't done it yet, we have an opportunity to reflect on it. And see, I want to teach that skill to the caregiver. All right, let's think about that idea that you have. How, how are you seeing that would work? What would that ideal situation look like? What would be the positive things that could happen by, by doing that? What would be some reasons why we might not want to do that idea? So I can pause and have them reflect and think about what would work, what wouldn't work, and then refine the idea. Because when I'm not there, I want them to be able to do the same thing. I want to build their capacity. So when I'm not there, they need to be able to come to ideas and try things. They need to be able to reflect on and remember the strategy that you taught them, perhaps, and to be able to implement it in the activity without you being there. And then realize whether it worked or not so they know when you come back, they need to talk with you further about that, that idea or that strategy. So you have a third handout that I'm, I'm sharing with you, which is our at-a-glance for reflective questions. And this at-a-glance gives you examples of, of some of the different types of reflective questions that you can ask. Again, they don't go in any particular order. We want this to flow like a natural conversation would flow. And so you'll be asking these questions as you would in the course of this conversation. Now, as we studied the 
questions that coaches used. So when we looked at the types of questions that coaches who were using these characteristics with fidelity were using, we found that they fell into four different types, awareness questions, analysis questions, alternatives questions, and action questions. And so we ask awareness questions to find out what they know, find out what they've tried. We ask analysis questions to dig a little deeper. Why do you think that's working? How well is that working? What would the ideal mealtime look like from the perspective of how he was communicating with you? So the answer is not readily apparent. Awareness questions are like, when does that happen? What does he do? What do you do? Analysis, how does that compare to what you want to have happen? Alternatives are our future-oriented questions. What ideas do you have for helping to make that happen? When, what are other times when you think you could use this strategy? Other times during your day. So those are future thinking, alternatives questions. Get them thinking forward and thinking about what their other options might be. We use action questions to help them get to a plan. So what is their plan going to be? So I ask questions like, so based on what we did today at mealtime, what is it that you're going to be focusing on with your child? What activity between now and the next time I come back? So that's a between visit planning action question. Or I might ask, the next time I come back, what's the activity that you really want us to dig into or to focus on? What's going to be most helpful for us to try when I come back? And so that's my future-oriented next visit action question. So we use these questions as they would come up. And, and I'm going to try to use more analysis and alternatives questions as I help them dig in and process and come up with ideas for how they can operationalize some of what it is that we're doing and learning. Now, here's a tip. Try not to ask yes-no questions. Yes-no questions sound like, did it work? Do you think you liked it? Are you, are you okay with that? See, yes, no. Yes, no questions are closed-ended questions and they shut the conversation down. We want to ask open-ended questions. When, where, what, how, so that we're open to the possibilities. I only ask yes, no questions when I'm asking permission or I'm avoiding an assumption. So I might ask them something like I um, asked earlier. Is it okay if I, I show you an idea? Could I try something? Or if I ask them, would you be willing to try it now? See, that's closed-ended because I'm asking permission. I don't want to assume that they're ready to try it with the child. They may need to, to see me try it another time. So I'm going to ask them. I'll ask permission to share information. Is it okay if I share an idea with you? Because I want to mark it that an idea is coming. Make sure that they're attending and they're focused on the information that's coming. Other than that, I don't use yes-no questions. And this is something that I really had to train myself in because yes-no questions just kind of flow from me. And so I challenge you to, to listen to the questions you're asking and see how many are open-ended versus these closed-ended yes-no. What about feedback? When can we share information? Some of you may be thinking, when do we give our ideas? Well, you can absolutely give your ideas. And here, here's when and here's how. But here are the four types of feedback that we see people using. Directive, evaluative, affirmative, and informative. And they're on this pyramid in terms of most often used and most helpful to least often used and least helpful. And the least helpful is directive feedback. Just telling the person what to do, giving suggestions, giving recommendations, making ideas or giving ideas before you ask them what they know and what they've tried and what's worked for them. So we really want to eliminate directive feedback. We don't want to use that or have that in our, our repertoire of uh, feed, types of feedback that we would use. The only reason we would use directive feedback when we're coaching is if imminent danger is present, if it's a safety issue. So if the child is, is running into the street, we're going we're gonna to shout out, grab him, Let, let's get him, let's, let's ca catch him before he runs into the street because it's a safety issue. But if it's not a safety issue, 
typically we can reflect on it. We can take time to reflect. Even if it's something that we don't want to have happen or it's something that could be dangerous, we can reflect on it before it happens. And then we teach them to reflect on it, recognize and reflect when we're not there. We provide um, evaluative feedback. So evaluative feedback, we're also pretty good at this. It's, it's when we say, oh, that's good. Great job. That was awesome. I like it how you got down on his level so he could see your mouth there. So we provide evaluative feedback. Now we want to moderate the amount of evaluative feedback we provide because too much evaluative feedback, too much of a good thing, some people say, can cause dependence. They become dependent on us telling them that they're doing good or that it's great. I want the person I'm coaching to be able to internalize that and know from within them, based on the outcomes that they're getting, based on the response they're getting from the child, that that worked, that that was really good because I want it to sustain when I'm not there. I provide affirmative feedback. I, I acknowledge without judging. Evaluative feedback has an element of judging. Good, that's good, that's, that's an element of judging. Affirmative says, I hear you. I understand what you're saying. That makes sense. That must have been really hard. So I affirm what it is that they know. I affirm what it is that they're doing and acknowledge that. Affirmation builds confidence. It helps them to become more confident because they know that they know what to do. And then look down there on the bottom, across the, all across the bottom. There's what you've been looking for. When can I share information? Well, you can share information and provide informative feedback is what we call it. So there are times where we're sharing our expertise. Remember, this is an expert-based approach to coaching. And so you have expertise to share. I'm not asking you to let go of all that. My goodness, you've worked hard to get your certifications and your degree and your experience. But let's use it to everyone's benefit, but it's when and how we use it. So instead of jumping in to, to share an idea, I'm going to ask them to reflect first. I'm going to ask before I share. Ask what they know before I share informative feedback. Then if I need to share informative feedback, I'm going to give them the information. It may be giving them an idea or, or teaching them how to use a strategy. And then I'm going to ask them to reflect on that. What do you think about what I just shared? What, what do you think about how that's going to work for you, that strategy I just showed you? See, I want them to analyze it. I want to know if they think that, yeah, I couldn't do that. That's not something I could, I could do. Because I need to know now while I'm there so we can figure out something else. So informative feedback. I keep them informed. I, I share information when I need to. But I observe first. I watch before I share. I ask before I share. Informative feedback. Well, here we are back to joint planning again. So at the end of every visit, like I, can, I cannot leave. I cannot stop a visit until I get a new, a new joint plan. Because I've got to ensure that something's going to be happening when I'm not there. And I've got to know when I'm supposed to come back. So it's a two-part joint plan. Part one, what's going to happen between the visits? What's the teacher, the child care provider, the parent, the nanny? What are they going to be doing when you're not there to support the child's ongoing learning? And I'm not going to talk about skills. Well, we're going to teach him to request by, by saying uh, more. Now, there's a skill aspect to it, but we focus on the activity. So they're going to focus on at meal time. they're going to support him in using these, these three words to start with. So we're going to get, we'll get very specific, but we want it to be contextualized. Second part of our plan, what's going to happen at our next visit? I have to have an activity setting. I never just show up bringing my bag of toys anymore. I'm in real life activities. I don't need a toy bag. I need the real life activity. And it comes with its own materials. The child's clothing at dressing time. The child's snack food at snack time. And, and it comes with an important adult, the teacher or the parent. So what's the activity we're going to focus on that's going to provide us the opportunity to support the child's learning and skills? Next visit plan. All right, so here's kind of a summary of if we're coaching of the three parts of an effective visit. First, we revisit the previous plan. What did they do? What were the activities and the, the strategies that they were using 
in between our visits and how well did that work. If not, then we can support them further in it. If it worked, we want to figure out what worked and why we think it worked. Second part of the effective visit, using coaching. We're going to participate in the real life routine alongside them. I'm shoulder to shoulder with them. And um, it's the reason why I'm there on that day at that time, because I want to be present for that activity. Part three, develop a new two-part plan. What's going to happen between the visits and then what's going to happen on our next visit. So we just keep rolling it forward. We use coaching to keep rolling it forward, to stay in activity settings, to, to help the parent can, or caregiver continue to use those strategies that we know um, are effective for supporting um, the child's learning and ability to participate in that activity. Um, uh, before we move to questions, and, and if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the Q&A now, and we'll see if we can get to some of those. But I want to leave you with some, some thoughts here, some particular thoughts. And I want to leave you with a quote by our colleague, Barbara Hanft, who um, was our co-author on the first book that Melissa Sheldon and I wrote on coaching. We wrote it with um, Barbara Hanft. And um, she, she says this, that our role, as effect, our role as effective interventionists and practitioners, therapists, is to move to a different position. See, before, I was in the position of being the one. I was, I was in front. I, I stepped out in front. I took the lead. I was working directly with the child, which may have benefited the child in that moment, but then we needed to carry it over, and that's where we used homework and handouts to carry it over. And I need the caregivers to know carryovers built into the activity because this is what it's going to look like. So I need to move to a different position and my position is alongside. It's not out in front. It's not behind them pushing them to do it or coaxing them to do it, but it's alongside. We're locking arms. We're shoulder to shoulder. And my role then is coach rather than lead player. So if I use, can use a sports analogy, I don't grab the child like a ball and run with it. I make sure that the important adults in that child's life know what to do, know how to do it, and know when to do it. And if they're doing it at meal times, snack times, bath times, getting dressed times, riding in the car times, circle time, those natural times that happen, it gives the child lots and lots of practice, more practice than we could ever possibly give them if those important people know how to do it. Several years ago, I was in a, a, a shop here in the town where I live in North Carolina, and, and there, there are lots of crafts uh, around here, a lot of, of um, People uh, do weaving and, and um, art and pottery. And, and I noticed a piece of handcrafted pottery from across the room, and it caught my eye. It was a, a, a vase that um, a potter had made. And it had a, a word on it, and the potter had um, somewhat spelled this word phonetically. Well, being a speech language pathologist you know, and loving you know, phonetics, it, it caught my eye right away. And so I went over to it to get, to get a closer look to see what the word was and what the message was. And the message also struck a chord with me. Um, and, and let me show you what that piece of pottery says. Capable. So it phonetically spells out capable. And I had to buy it because that's the message that I want to send as a coach. That's the message that I want to send. I want caregivers to know that you are capable of supporting your child's learning and development. And you don't have to you know, go back to school. You don't have to become your child's teacher. What I'm talking about and what we're talking about is parenting. It's supporting the child's learning. It's doing the things that you have to do and need to do on a daily basis. But you're, you're doing some additional things or you're making some adaptations perhaps to how you would typically do it 
that are learned from your therapist or your provider to increase your knowledge and skills to support your child's ability to communicate and participate in all of these activities that are going on. So I want the message to parents and caregivers and teachers and child care providers to be, you are capable. And I want the message that those important people in that child's life send to that child to be, you are capable. You are capable of communicating. And so we're going to support you in knowing how to do that. And so the message I want to send to you all is you are capable of becoming great coaches. But use a coaching approach that has a definition you can operationalize and you can share with the people you're coaching and your colleagues and that has research-based characteristics like I've shared so you know that you're doing it. So you are competent and confident in coaching and knowing how to build capacity using the coaching strategy to support your learners in your life. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's been a pleasure being here. Um, and let's see what questions you have about coaching. We've got a few minutes left. Thank you, um, Dathan, uh, Dr. Rush, um, for an amazing uh, kickoff, right, to the AG Bell um, Symposium. Um, you know, I think a lot of the things that you mentioned obviously resonate with me as well as a pediatric psychologist, and it's nice to see so many strategies crossing over for disciplines that are so effective in helping parents and, and really fostering language development for children. Um, do you have any suggestions or recommendations to kind of encourage some, um, some of maybe the attendees that haven't tried to do coaching? Because um, I'm sure, as, as you and I know, a lot of mistakes happen. We are not perfect. And sometimes we might do something that maybe we figure it was a mistake or we would have done differently. Do you have any encouraging <laughs> words for the new um, therapists that are listening and across the globe of how to get going with using some of these techniques? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So when I um, was working with families in my early days of practice, now when I got out of school as a speech language pathologist and I earned my certificate of clinical competence and I got my first job, I thought I, sh I should know everything. I thought that I, sh I should have all the answers. Now, it didn't take me too long, you know, maybe my first uh, uh, client or the first family that I supported to figure out, okay, there's a lot of things I don't know. Um, why didn't my graduate program do a better job? You know, is what I thought initially. Then I thought, you know what? They did a great job because they prepared me to figure out and find the answers if I don't know it. But that also what I learned was to ask questions, ask families. Because uh, how I learned to ask questions was out of sheer need to know. I needed to know what they knew. And so if they ask me something that I didn't really know, I would ask them, well, what, what have you already tried? What kind, of, what kind of things have you done? Or what do you know uh, about that? And those are reflective questions. And, and when we ask those, it builds that confidence in the parent that they do know. And you know what? And, uh, hardly ever did a caregiver ever say nothing. I haven't done a thing. Or I don't know. Now, a few times they'll say, I don't know. But if I'm asking them questions about things that are real to them, that's part of their real life, then they, they are going to know the answers to those. So how do you get started with coaching? Observe. Look at the situation. And then ask the, ask the caregiver questions about it. Ask what they know. Start with what they know. Um, and then be there alongside them. Get them involved. Have them be involved. Have them take the lead. Get, use activities where the caregiver has to be involved. If I use play activities, so if I got down on the, on the floor, which we all do, and I start interacting with the child and playing with the child, the parent can just watch passively and can be very pleased with what it is that I'm doing because they think that that's my time with the child. But if I use activities that the parent has to be involved in, dressing time, um, changing the diaper. I'm not going to do that. They're going to do that. 
then that builds their capacity. And we can talk about what it is that we want the child to learn in that activity. And we can talk about how they're going to be the one to support them doing it. But I'm there shoulder to shoulder to support them in it. Yes, absolutely. I think um, that's really important too, given that we have so many different uh, countries represented and there's a lot, of, a lot of cultural differences when we talk yes. about toys and activities. So just letting them take the lead is really crucial and we can apply for, um, for any you know, therapist or educator that's here. So um, thank you again for this, for coming to speak at the AG Val uh, Listening and Spoken Language Virtual Symposium. It's been great to have you here. And um, I don't know if you saw, but in the chat, there's plenty of messages uh, thanking you for all of the resources. Um, so thank you so much. Quite welcome. Thank you all.